Hello, mystery and suspense fans, and welcome to K.L. Murphy's Her Sister's Death. My name's Jess, and this is CamCat Unwrapped. I'll be introducing you to each episode of K.L. Murphy's haunting tale, Her Sister's Death. Meet Val Ritter, a reporter whose world is turned upside down when she learns that her sister has been found dead in a swanky Baltimore hotel room. Sounds like there's a mystery afoot. The twists and turns of this tale are mirrored in a parallel timeline where we follow Bridget Wallace on the day she's to be married in 1921. But what seems like a comfortable match to an older, eligible man takes a dark turn. I'm dying. Well, not literally, of course, to jump into this one. This is a story of love, grief, and courage, but it's also a story about an old historic hotel that comes to life in both timelines. And beyond all of that, her sister's death is an unputdownable story of suspense that will have you obsessed with finding the truth about the lives of those who stayed at the beautiful and mysterious Franklin Hotel. If you don't want to miss a beat, check out Her Sister's Death now on the audiobook platform of your choice. All our books are also available in print and ebook formats on camcatbooks.com or wherever books are sold. The first few episodes of every book can always be found on Camcat Unwrapped, but subsequent episodes will only be available for free listening for a short time after their release. So subscribe to Camcat Unwrapped, and if you love this story, you can support the author by buying their audiobook. Trust me, you won't regret it. Our story opens with Val at the library, still reeling from the news that her sister is gone, where she meets an unexpected ally. Meanwhile, it's young Bridget's wedding day, but she's no typical blushing bride. Is this a case of cold feet or is it something else? Let's find out together as we check in to the Franklin Hotel. CamCat Publishing presents Her Sister's Death by K.L. Murphy, narrated by Rachel Fulginetti, Kate Rudd, and Kurt Bonham. Present Day, Chapter 1. Val, Monday, 9.17 a.m. Once, when I was nine or maybe ten, I spent weeks researching a three-paragraph paper on polar bears. I don't remember much about the report or polar bears, but that assignment marked the beginning of my lifelong love affair with research. As I got older, I came to believe that if I did the research, I could solve any problem. It didn't matter what it was, school, work, relationships. In college, when I suspected a boyfriend was about to give me the brush off, I researched what to say before he could break up with me. Surprisingly, there are dozens of pages about this stuff. Even more surprising, some of it actually works. We stayed together another couple of months until I realized I was better off without him. He never saw it coming. When I got married, I researched everything from whether or not we were compatible, we were, to our average life expectancy based on our medical histories, only two years different, Some couples swear they're soulmates or some other crap, but I considered myself a little more practical than that. I wanted the facts before I walked down the aisle. The thing is, research doesn't tell you that your perfect on-paper husband is going to prefer the ditzy receptionist on the third floor before you've hit your five-year anniversary. It also doesn't tell you that your initial anger will turn into something close to relief or that all that perfection was too much work, and maybe the whole soulmate thing isn't as crazy as it sounds. If you doubt me, look it up. My love of research isn't as odd as one might think. My father is a retired history professor, and my mother is a bibliophile. It doesn't matter the genre. She usually has three or more books going at once— She also gets two major newspapers every day and a half dozen magazines each month. Some people collect cute little china creatures or rare coins or something, 
my mother collects words. When I decided to become a journalist, both my parents were overjoyed. It's perfect, my father said. We need more people to record what's going on in the world. How can we expect to learn if we don't recognize that everything that happens impacts our future? I fought the urge to roll my eyes. I knew what was coming. But how many times can a person hear about the rise and fall of Caesar? The man was stabbed to death, and it isn't as though anyone learned their lesson. Ask Napoleon, or Hitler. My dad was right about one thing, though. History can't help but repeat itself. Honey, my mother interrupted, Val will only write about important topics. You know very well she is a young lady of principle. Again, I wanted to roll my eyes. Of course, for all their worldliness, neither of my parents understands how the world of journalism works. You don't walk into a newsroom as an inexperienced reporter and declare you will be writing about the environment or the European financial market or the latest domestic policy. The newspaper business is not so different from any other, even right down to the way technology is forcing it to go digital. Either way, the newbies are given the jobs no one else wants. Naturally, I was assigned to obituaries. After a year, I got moved to covering the local city council meetings, but the truth was, I missed the death notices. I couldn't stop myself from wondering how each of the people died. Some were obvious. When the obituary asks you to donate to the Cancer Society or the Heart Association, you don't have to think too hard to figure it out. Also, people like to add that the deceased fought a brave battle with fill-in-the-blank. I've no doubt those people were brave, but they weren't the ones that interested me. It was the ones that seemed to die unexpectedly and under unusual circumstances. I started looking them up for more information. The murder victims held particular fascination for me. From there, it was only a short hop to my true interest crime reporting. The job isn't for everyone. Crime scenes are not pretty. Have you ever rushed out at three in the morning to a nightclub shooting? Or sat through a murder trial, forced to view photo after photo of a brutally beaten young mother plastered across a giant screen? My sister once told me, I must have a twisted soul to do what I do. Maybe. I find myself wondering about the killer, Curious about what makes them do it. That sniper, the one that picked off the poor folks as they came out of the state fair, that was my story. Even now, I still can't get my head around that guy's motives. So I research and research, trying to get things right as well as find some measure of understanding. It doesn't always work, but knowing as much as I can is its own kind of answer. Asking questions has always worked for me. It's the way I do my job. It's the way I've solved every problem in my life. Until now. Not that I'm not trying. I'm at the library. I'm in my favorite corner in the cushy chair with the view of the pond. I don't know how long I've been here. How many hours. My laptop is on, the screen filled with text and pictures. Flicking through the tabs... I swallow the bile that reminds me I have no answer. I've asked the question in every way I can think of, but for the first time in my life, Google is no help. Why did my sister, my gorgeous sister, with her two beautiful children and everything to live for, kill herself? Why? Sylvia has been dead for four days now. Actually, I don't know how long she's been dead. I've been told there's a backlog at the ME's office. Apparently, suicides are not high priority when you live in a city with one of the country's highest murder rates. I don't care what the cause of death is. I want the truth. While we wait for the official autopsy, I find myself reevaluating what I do know. Her body was discovered on Thursday at the Franklin, a do-not-disturb sign hanging from the door of her room. 
The hotel claims my sister called the front desk after only one day and asked not to be disturbed unless the sign was removed. This little detail could not have been more surprising. My sister doesn't have trouble sleeping. Sylvia went to bed at 10 every night and was up like clockwork by six sharp. I have hundreds of texts to prove it. Even when her children were babies with sleep schedules that would kill most people, she somehow managed to stick to her routine. Vacations with her were pure torture. Val, get up. The sun is shining. Let's go for a walk on the beach. I'd open one eye to find her standing in the doorway. She'd be dressed in black nylon shorts and neon sneakers, bouncing up and down on her toes. We can walk. I promise I won't run. Tossing my pillow at her, I'd groan and pull the covers over my head. You can't sleep the day away, Val. She'd cross the room in two strides and rip back the sheets. Get up. In spite of my night owl tendencies, I'd crawl out of bed. Sylvia had a way of making me feel like if I didn't join her, I'd be missing out on something extraordinary. The thing is, she was usually right. Sure, a sunrise is a sunrise, but a sunrise with Sylvia was color and laughter and tenderness and love. She had that way about her. She loved mornings. I tried to explain Sylvia to the police officer, to tell him that hanging a sleeping sign past six in the morning, much less all day, was not only odd behavior, but also downright suspicious. He did his best not to dismiss me outright, but I knew he didn't get it. Sleeping too much can be a sign of depression, he said. She wasn't depressed. She hung a sign, ma'am. It's been verified by the manager. He stopped short of telling me that putting out that stupid sign wasn't atypical of someone planning to do what she did. Whatever that's supposed to mean. The screen in front of me blurs and I rub my burning eyes. There are suicide statistics for women of a certain age, women with children, women in general. My fingers slap the keys. I change the question, desperate for an answer. Any answer. A shadow falls across the screen when a man takes the chair across from me, a newspaper under his arm. My throat tightens and I press my lips together. He settles in, stretching his legs. The paper crackles as he opens it and snaps when he straightens the pages. Do you mind? He lowers the paper, his brows drawn together. Mind what? This is a library. It's supposed to be quiet in here. He angles his head. Are you always this touchy, or is it just me? It's you. I don't know why I say that. I don't even know why I'm acting like a brat, but I can't help myself. Silence fills the space between us as he appears to digest what I've said. Perhaps you'd like me to leave? That would be nice. He blinks, the paper falling from his hand. I'm not sure which of us is more surprised by my answer. I seem to have no control over my thoughts or my mouth. The man has done nothing but crinkle a newspaper, but I have an overwhelming need to lash out. He looks around, and for a moment, I feel bad. The man gets to his feet, the paper jammed under his arm. Look, lady, I'll move to another spot but that's because I don't want to sit here and have my morning ruined by some kook who thinks the public library is her own personal living room. He points a finger at me. You've got a problem. I feel the sting, the well of tears, before he's even turned his back. They flood my eyes and pour down over my cheeks. Worse, my mouth opens, and I sob. Great, loud, obnoxious sobs. I cover my face with my hands and sink lower into the chair, my body folding in on itself. My laptop slips to the floor, and I somehow cry harder. Is she all right? A woman asks, her voice high and tight. The annoying man answers. She'll be fine in a minute. Are you sure? 
Her gaze darts between us, and her hands flutter over me like wings, nearing but never touching. I recognize her from the reference desk. People are staring. This is a library, you know. I want to laugh, but it gets caught in my throat and comes out like a bark. Her little kitten heels skitter back. I don't blame her. Who wouldn't want to get away from the woman making strange animal noises? Do you have a private conference room? The man asks. The woman points the way, and large hands lift me to my feet. Can you get her laptop and her bag, please? The hands turn into an arm around my shoulders. He steers me toward a small room at the rear of the library. My sobs morph into hiccups. The woman places my bag and computer on a small round table. I'll make sure no one bothers you here. She slinks out, pulling the door shut. The man sets his paper down and pulls out a chair for me. I don't know how many minutes pass before I'm able to stop crying, before I'm able to speak. Are you okay now? I can't look at him. His voice is kind, far kinder than I deserve. He pushes something across the table. Here's my handkerchief. He gets to his feet. I'm going to see if I can find you some water. The door clicks behind him, and I'm alone. My sister, my best friend, is gone. And I'm alone. Do you want to talk about it? The man asks, setting a bottle of water and a package of crackers on the table. Sniffling, I twist the damp, wadded-up handkerchief into a ball. I want to tell him that no, I don't want to talk about it, that I don't even know him. But the words slip out anyway. My sister died, I say. Oh, he folds his hands together. I'm sorry. Recently? Four days. He pushes the crackers he's brought across the table. You should try to eat something. I try to remember when I last ate. Yesterday? The day before? One of my neighbors did bring me a casserole with some kind of brown meat and orangey red sauce. It may have had noodles, but I can't be sure. I do remember watching the glob of whatever it was slide out of the aluminum pan and down the disposal. I think I ate half a bagel at some point. My stomach churns, then rumbles. The man doesn't wait for me to decide. He opens the packet and pushes it closer. For some reason I can't explain, I want to prove I'm more polite than I seemed earlier. I take the crackers and eat. He gestures at the bottle. Drink. I do. The truth is, I'm too numb to do anything else. It's been four days since my parents phoned me. Up to now, I've taken the news like any other story I've been assigned. I filed it away, stored it at the back of my mind as something I need to analyze and figure out before it can be processed. I've buried myself in articles and anecdotes and medical pages, reading anything and everything to try and understand. On some level, I recognize my behavior isn't entirely normal. My parents broke down, huddled together on the sofa, as though conjoined in their grief. I couldn't have slipped between them even if I wanted to. Sylvia's husband, I guess that's what we're still calling him, appeared equally stricken. Not even the sight of her children, their faces pale and blank, cracked the shell I erected the wall I built to deny the reality of her death. Aunt Val? Mary asked. Mommy's coming back, right? She's just passed, right? That's what Daddy said. She paused, a single tear trailing over her pink cheek. What's past? Mary is the youngest, only five. Miles is ten, going on 20 if you ask me, which turned out to be a good thing in that moment. Miles took his sister by the hand. Come on, Mary. Dad wants us in the back. I let out a breath. Crisis averted. My sister has been gone four days, and I haven't shed a tear. 
until today. The man across the table clears his throat. Are you feeling any better? No, I'm not feeling better. My sister is still dead. God, I'm a bitch. I expect him to stand up and leave, or at least point out what an ass I'm being when he's gone out of his way to be nice. But he does neither. Yes, I suppose she is. Death is kind of permanent. I jerk back in my chair. Is that supposed to be funny? Unlike me, he does apologize. I'm sorry, that didn't come out right. I never did have the best bedside manner for the job. I take a closer look at the man. Are you a doctor? He half laughs. Hardly. Detective. Former, I mean. I never quite got the hang of talking to the victim's families without putting my foot in my mouth. Seems I've done it again. My curiosity gets the best of me. He's not much older than I am. Mid-forties, maybe younger. Definitely too young for retirement. Former detective? What do you do now? I run a security firm. He lifts his shoulders. It's different. Has its advantages. The way he says it, I know he misses the job. I understand. I write for the Baltimorean. Mostly homicides, I say. That's a good paper. I've probably read your work then. Crumpling the empty cracker wrapper, I say, I'm sorry I dumped on you out there. He shrugs again. It's okay. You had a good reason. I can't think of anything to say to that. How did she die, if you don't mind my asking? The question hits me hard. What I mind is that my sister is gone. My hands ball into fists. The heater in the room hums, but otherwise, it's quiet. They say she died by suicide. The man doesn't miss a beat, but you don't believe it. He watches me, his body still. My heart pounds in my chest, and I reach into my mind, searching for any information I've found that contradicts what I've been told. I've learned that almost 50,000 people a year die by suicide in the United States. Strangely, a number of those people choose to do it in hotels. Maybe it's the anonymity. Maybe it's to spare the families. There are plenty of theories, but unfortunately, one can't really ask the departed about that. Still, the reasoning is sound enough. For four days, I've read until I can't see, and my head has dropped from exhaustion. I know that suicide can be triggered by traumatic events or chronic depression. It can be triggered by life upheaval or can be drug-induced. Or it can happen for any number of reasons that even close family and friends don't know about until after. If ever. I know all this. And yet, I can't accept it. Sylvia was found in a hotel room she had no reason to be in. An empty pill bottle was found on the nightstand next to her. She checked in alone. Nothing in the room had been disturbed. Nothing appeared to have been taken. For all these reasons, the police made a preliminary determination that the cause of death was suicide, the final ruling to be made after the ME's report. I know all this. My parents and Sylvia's husband took every word of this at face value. But I can't. Sylvia is not a statistic, and I know something they don't. No, I don't believe it, I say, meeting his steady gaze with my own. He doesn't react. He doesn't tell me I'm crazy. He doesn't say, I'm sorry, again. Nothing. I'm disappointed, though I can't imagine why. He's a stranger to me. Still, I press my shoulder blades against the back of the chair, waiting. I figure it out, then. Former detective. I've been around enough cops to know how it works. It's like a tribe with them. You don't criticize another officer. You don't question anyone's toughness or loyalty to the job. You don't question a ruling that a case doesn't warrant an investigation. 
much less that it isn't even a case. So, I sit and wait. I will not be the first to argue. It doesn't matter that he's retired and left the job. He's still one of them. In fact, the more I think about it, I can't understand why he's still sitting there. I've been rude to the man. I've completely broken down in front of him like some helpless idiot. And now, I've suggested the cause of death that everyone, and I mean everyone, says is true, is not the truth at all. He gets up, shoves his hands in his pockets. This is it. He's done with me now. In less than one minute, he'll be gone, and suddenly, I don't want him to leave. I break the silence. I'm Val Ritter. Terry Martin. I turn the name over in my brain. It's familiar in a vague way. Terry, the former detective. Uh-huh. He shifts his weight from one foot to the other. Look, I'm sorry about your sister. You've lost someone you love, and the idea that she might have taken her own life is doubly distressing. I'm way past distressed. I'm angry. Is it possible that you're directing that anger toward the ones that ruled her death a suicide instead of at your... His words fall away. My sister? Yes. I might be if I thought she did this. I cross my arms over my chest, but I don't. This idea, this thing they're saying, makes no sense at all. Terry, the former detective's voice, is low, soothing. Why? My arms drop again. I'm tempted to tell him everything I know, which, admittedly, isn't much. But I hold back. This man is a stranger. Sure, he's been nice, and every time I've expected him to walk out the door, he's done the opposite. But that doesn't mean I can trust him. I'm sorry if my question seems insensitive he says. His voice is soft, comforting in a neutral way, and I can picture him in an interrogation. He would be the good cop. No matter how shocking the, uh, idea might be, I have a feeling you have your reasons. You were close, you and your sister? We were. I sit there, twisting the handkerchief in my fingers. The heater makes a revving noise drops back to a steady hum. We talked all the time, and I can tell you she wasn't depressed. That's what they kept saying. She must have been depressed. I know people hide things, but she was never good at hiding her emotions from me. If anything, she'd been happier than ever. I give a slow shake of my head. They tried to tell me about the other suicide, and about the pills, and the sign on the door, and... I stop. I hear myself rambling and force myself to take a breath. If something had been wrong, I would have known. Terry, the former detective, doesn't react, doesn't move. He keeps his mouth shut, but I know. He doesn't believe me, same as all the others. I can tell. There is no head bob or leading question. He thinks I'm in denial and that I will eventually accept the truth. He doesn't know me at all. The minutes pass, and I drink the water. I realize I feel better. It's time to leave. I should be going. I hold up the crumpled rag in my hand. Sorry I did such a number on your handkerchief. I can clean it, send it to you later. He waves off the suggestion. Keep it. I gather my items and apologize again. Sorry you had to witness my meltdown out there. It happens. I'm headed out the door, my hand on the knob, when he breaks protocol. What did you mean by the other suicide? Chapter 2 Terry Monday, 10.02 a.m. The woman, Val, I remind myself, hesitates. I can see she's wary, worried I don't believe her. 
I don't know that I do, but I am curious. What did you mean there was another suicide? A month ago, maybe a little longer, a woman killed herself in the same hotel. She jumped off the roof, which apparently was no easy task since there were all kinds of doors to go through to get up there. Of course, what happened to her was horrible, but it has nothing to do with my sister. I don't know why they're acting like it does. My jaw tightens. Which hotel? The Franklin. I look past her and think maybe I should be surprised, but nothing about that hotel surprises me. The Franklin, I say, echoing her words. The Franklin is one of Baltimore's oldest hotels. Built in 1918, it's 15 stories high with marble columns and archways at the entrance, along with the Belvedere, before it became condos, and the Lord Baltimore, the Franklin was a destination, a swanky place that attracted film stars and politicians for decades. Somewhere along the line, it fell into disrepair, and the famous guests went elsewhere. For a brief time, the management offered rooms for short-term rentals, desperate to keep the hotel from plunging further into the red. Twenty years ago, the hotel was sold to an investment group. They declared the hotel historic, sunk tens of millions of dollars into it, and reopened it in grand style. The governor and the mayor cut the big red ribbon. Baseball stars from the Orioles and a well-known director were photographed at the official gala. It was a big to-do for the city at the time. Since then, it's remained popular one of the five-star hotels downtown, which, of course, means that a night there doesn't come cheap. That's the press release version. But there's another one, lesser known. Val is calm now, watching me, and I catch a glimpse of the reporter. Do you know it? she asks. Yeah, I know it. Stories have circulated about the hotel through the years. Some are decades old, while others have been encouraged by the hotel itself. Ghost tours are popular these days, and the Franklin tour is no exception. It has a history. For a while, it was called the Mad Motel. She flinches. What? According to my grandfather, people seemed to die there. Most deaths occurred right after the Depression, victims of the stock market crash but not all. There was one guy that killed his whole family right before he killed himself. They said he lost his mind. That was the first time it was called the Mad Motel, though there were other stories. What are you saying? I see the flush on her cheeks and know my words have upset her in a way I didn't intend. I do my best to smooth it over. Nothing. I didn't mean anything. I've never been a fan of the name myself, but there were some guys around the department that used it. The anger that colored her cheeks a moment earlier fades, eclipsed by something else I recognize. Curiosity. Why would they use such a terrible name? It's a valid question, and I give the only explanation I can. The first time I heard it on the job was about 15 years ago. An assault at the Franklin. I didn't catch the case, but I remember a man almost beat his wife to death. He would have if someone in the next room hadn't called the police. She doesn't blink, doesn't raise a hand to her mouth, just waits. Before that day, the guy was a typical accountant. Kind of nerdy, mild-mannered, went to work, went home to his family. Nothing out of the ordinary. Then they fly into Baltimore for their nephew's wedding, stay at the Franklin. As they were dressing, he loses it. He hits her with the lamp, punches her, throws her up against the wall. When the police arrived, they had to pry him off of her. They rushed her to the hospital. She ended up with broken ribs, a concussion, a whole bunch of other stuff. And the husband? That's what was so strange. According to the officers on the scene, as soon as they pulled him off, he stopped all of it. He cried, 
begged to be allowed to go with her to the hospital. When they took him downtown, he swore he didn't know what had come over him, that he'd never hit anyone in his life, and he couldn't even recall being angry with her. They kept him in jail until she woke up. Oddly, she corroborated his story. She said he didn't have a violent bone in his body before that day. Val's forehead wrinkles. I don't remember ever reading about that case. What happened? He was charged in spite of his wife's insistence that she didn't want that. When he went to trial, his lawyer put him on the stand. That's when I heard his story. I pause and run a hand over my face, scratching at my chin. He told the jury that while he was putting on his tux jacket, a cold breeze blew in. He said he checked the room, but the windows were closed, and it was winter, so the heat was on. Then, according to him, this cold air got into his body, in his hands and his feet, and then his mind. He said when his wife came out of the bathroom, he didn't recognize her, that she was someone else, something else. Something else? What does that mean? He described a monster with sharp teeth and claws. His attorney even had a drawing done by a sketch artist. She held it up for the jury, but the man wouldn't look at it, refused. He claimed he panicked, grabbed the lamp and swung, but the monster kept coming. He said the monster howled, that was probably his wife screaming, and came at him again. That must have been when the guest in the other room called the police. I pause again. Even as I say it, I know how it sounds. So, he tells this story at trial, and everyone looks around at each other thinking this guy is crazy. But his wife is in the audience and nodding like it's true. The prosecutor goes after him, but he doesn't back down. He admits he attacked someone, but he swears he didn't knowingly hurt his wife. He breaks down on the stand, and it's basically bedlam in the courtroom. Memories of that day flood my mind. I sat in the back of the packed courtroom, watching the melee. It was hard to know what to think. Was the man delusional, a sociopath? Or was he telling the truth? Fortunately, Val doesn't ask my opinion, and I tell her the rest. The prosecutor decided to cut his losses, I say. He let the man plead to a lesser charge and get some mental help. That's all? Yep. The man did three months in a mental health facility, then went back to Omaha and his wife. End of story. So that's why the Franklin is called the Mad Motel? It's one of the reasons. But like I said, the place has a history. Newspaper articles and pictures and evidence files flit through my mind. Many of the images are gruesome. Others just sad. Although the library is warm, I'm cold under my jacket. My voice drops to a whisper. The memory's too close for comfort. A history of death. 1921. Chapter 3. Bridget. Bridget Wallace touched the slippery silk of her wedding dress her fingers trembling as they trailed over the length of the gown. The white dress hung before her, draped over the three-sided panel. She admired the plunging back, though she'd been careful to choose a gown with an appropriately reserved neckline. Even so, Lawrence was likely to disapprove. Trousers on women? He'd asked one day as he caught her perusing the latest issue of Harper's Bazaar. What's next? Skirts above the knees. She stepped back, studying the white gown. Loose chiffon sleeves ended just past the shoulder, and the tiny waist was cinched by a wide band of satin. But it was the long train that had drawn her to the dress. It was made of the same chiffon, so light and sheer that she worried she would snag it before the ceremony. Dozens and dozens of white flowers had been embroidered onto the train. She loved that dress so much. Her mother came into the room, her arms full of gifts and packages. Look at this, 
Catherine said. I don't know how we're going to get all of these out to the country. Bridget's teeth closed down on her lower lip. After the wedding, she would live in the country. She was a city girl with friends and a job. What would happen to her? Her mother sorted through a handful of envelopes, raising one in the air. Why, this one is from your Uncle Ezra up in New York. You know who he is, don't you, dear? I'm sure this will be most generous. She held it up to the light, as though she could see through the thick paper without her spectacles. Oh, I'd love to open it now, but that would be bad luck, wouldn't it? She let out a long sigh. Unless you wanted to see what's inside, well, then I would be obliged to open it right away. The young bride-to-be couldn't bring herself to wonder about the envelopes. Whatever was inside wouldn't change the way she felt. But then again, no one seemed to care about that. Bridget? She shook her head and flicked her hand. Open it if you must, Mother. Are you sure? She toyed with the envelope, then set it aside. Dear, you look a fright. The young woman lifted a hand to her hair, smoothing the flyaways, and wondered what kind of mother says such a thing to her daughter on her wedding day. She walked to the small mirror hanging over the sink. Any amusement faded. Her mother was right. It would take all her powder skills to hide the pouches under her eyes. I didn't sleep much last night, she said. Catherine clucked her tongue. Of course you didn't, dear. No woman sleeps the night before her wedding. She sat down and folded her hands in her lap. I suppose I should tell you what to expect, you know, after the wedding. Bridget sat down opposite her mother. This should be interesting. After the wedding supper, you will retire to the Franklin. I have to hand it to Lawrence. He's chosen one of the finest hotels. I've been told the bridal suite is nothing short of spectacular. Imagine it. You will be staying in the same room once slept in by Mary Pickford. Your father promised to take me to her next film, you know. Catherine's skin glowed as she talked. I keep telling you, Bridget, this is one of the advantages of marrying a man who is established, a man who knows how to show his wife that he cares about her. You understand how important that is. Bridget worried she understood far more than her mother realized, but she knew better than to comment. Yes, mother. Good. Well, as I was saying, you will be spending your first evening as husband and wife at the Franklin. Lawrence will be expecting you to perform your wifely duty, as all men do. It can't be helped, but you're young, and both of you will be wanting children as soon as possible. Would she? Bridget tried to picture herself with a baby in her lap, a toddler at her feet, and Lawrence at her side, smoking a cigar. But no matter how many times she tried to imagine it, the image wouldn't come into focus. Was something wrong with her? She wished her sister would arrive. Her mother snapped her fingers. Oh, I almost forgot. She jumped up and rushed to the mahogany chest. From the top drawer, she pulled out a garment wrapped in tissue. I got this for your wedding night. She unwrapped the package and held up a nightgown. The pale pink satin cascaded to the floor, the sound of it unfolding like a whisper. Isn't it lovely? It's exactly your color, dear. Surely no man could object to this. Bridget stared at the gown. Like her wedding dress, it was beautiful and elegant and a reminder of what was about to happen. Her mouth went dry, and she clamped her knees together to keep them from knocking. Lawrence objected to a great many things. Her mother set the nightgown aside. About tonight, no doubt you may be shocked by what is to happen, but you'll get used to it. Bridget's heart skipped. Get used to it. She understood most of what happened between a man and a woman but her mother's words were nevertheless unsettling. Lawrence never stopped reminding her that a woman should be held in high regard. He'd touched her less than a half dozen times, and though he'd brushed his lips across her cheek and hand, he'd not yet kissed her on the mouth. 
What do you mean I'll get used to it? Catherine's features softened, and she took her daughter's hands in hers. A lady doesn't discuss these things, my dear, but you're my daughter, so just this once. She stroked Bridget's hand with the curve of her nail. The first time you lay with your new husband may be difficult or even painful, but that won't last. I don't know. I don't want, she blinked. Was this the supportive talk she'd been expecting? There was so much she wanted to say, but she didn't know how. I'm afraid. Lawrence is not. There's nothing to be afraid of, her mother interrupted, patting Bridget's hand. No one dies from marital duties, you know. Bridget opened her mouth to say that wasn't what she was afraid of, but she didn't get the chance. Catherine got to her feet. I'm quite sure you will be fine, dear. After all, Lawrence is a wonderful man. He's promised your father and I that he will take care of you until his dying day. His devotion to you is absolute. We are so happy to know that you will have a husband who adores you so. Bridget stared at the floor. It was true that Lawrence had promised her parents all of these things, and he'd promised her sister and her. But he'd made other promises, too. Promises Bridget had never shared. You are a lucky woman, Bridget. Truly lucky. Chapter 4 Bridget. I'm so sorry I'm late. Margaret rushed into the bedroom, her hair flying behind her. The trains were running late again. I got here as quick as I could. She bent over at the waist, a hand to her side. Charles and I had to practically run here. She wiped beads of sweat from her hairline. Goodness, it's warm in here, isn't it? Catherine crossed the room, embracing her eldest daughter. Thank heavens you made it, Margaret. The lines around her mouth deepened and she wagged a finger. You and Charles should have made the trip yesterday, as I told you. You're right, mother, you always are, Margaret said as she sat down, winking at Bridget over her shoulder. I saw that, Catherine said, swooping about the room, rearranging the hairbrushes and tidying the stockings. While she worked, she prattled on about the small wedding party and the lunch and the weather until Margaret stood up again. She kissed her mother on the cheek and said, It's lovely to see you, mother, but I'm the matron of honor, and I do believe it's time to start getting the bride ready. She placed her hand on the small of her mother's back. Out with you now. How did I raise such a bossy child? Catherine asked, even as she allowed herself to be pushed from the room. Some would say I take after my mother, Margaret shot back and closed the door after her. Well, she said with a flounce, I never thought she'd leave. Bridget burst out laughing. She hugged her sister then. I'm so glad you're here. Me too. She dabbed at her forehead again. It is hot, isn't it? Shall I open a window? Without waiting for an answer, Margaret wrenched the small window open. The chilly December air swept through the room. Bridget shivered. Margaret, though, turned her flushed face toward the cold. That's better. Margaret, it's freezing outside, Bridget said, no longer laughing. Are you ill? Her sister lowered the window again. No, not at all. I'm... She paused and glanced toward the door. She came closer to her sister and lowered her voice. I'm with child. Bridget raised a hand to her mouth. Margaret had been married nearly three years, and up to now there'd been no sign of a baby. She wrapped her sister in a warm hug. I'm so happy for you. Shh, I don't want mother to know until after the wedding. Oh, Margaret, I don't mind. This is such wonderful news. Thank you, dear sister. But I do mind. She sat down on the edge of the bed. Charles and I agreed that before the wedding, I would share this news with you alone, like old times. Margaret patted the bed, and Bridget sat down beside her. 
Do you remember how it would drive Mother crazy when we had our secret language? Oh, yes, Bridget said with a laugh. How old had she been then? Six? Seven? And remember how she forbade us to use it outside the house, but we did anyway? Margaret giggled and unpinned her hat. And when we got older, we would whisper so she couldn't hear. And the coded messages we would tap out under the table. Do you remember the one about Uncle Carlton and his eyebrows? Old spider brows, the way they looked like they were creeping across his giant forehead? Her sister laughed louder. Mother nearly went apoplectic when she found out about that one. The sisters exchanged grins. I don't know if I've seen her so angry as that night. She barely spoke to us for days. Hallelujah, Margaret said, and the pair giggled again. When will you tell her? Bridget asked. Her sister tossed her head. Oh, I don't know. Tonight, maybe. Although I might wait until we have to leave. She won't be able to pester me with everything I'm already doing wrong when I'm boarding a train. Can't you hear her now? Margaret launched into an imitation of their mother, then shook her head. Thank goodness we don't live here in Baltimore. Is that why you and Charles moved to Washington? To be farther away from mother? Yes, I suppose. I miss you. I miss you, too. Margaret raised a hand and pushed a lock of Bridget's hair behind her ear. But you won't be alone, Bridget. You'll be married. You'll move to Lawrence's farm, and it won't be long before you have children, too. Bridget shifted on the bed. Mother was talking to me about wifely duties. It sounded terrible. Margaret waved her hand. Don't listen to her. She said the same thing to me, and I was petrified. But she's wrong. It's not terrible at all. It's the opposite of terrible. The opposite? Yes, don't let mother get in your head, Margaret insisted. She's probably pacing right now. Sure, you will be late to your own wedding. She's the queen of spreading doom and gloom, remember? Bridget did remember. But lately, Mother had been different, and Bridget had never clashed with her in quite the same way her older sister had. Catherine had been more positive of late, particularly when it came to Lawrence and the wedding. Had she been the same with Margaret and Charles? You and Lawrence will be very happy at the farm. It will be just the two of you, away from everyone and everything, Margaret said, away from Mother. Don't worry so much. A hardness formed in the pit of Bridget's stomach. Just the two of you. Margaret thought she was easing her younger sister's fears, calming her in the final hours before her wedding. But Bridget's heartbeat drummed, echoing in her ears. Away from everyone and everything. Margaret stood up. If we don't start getting you ready, we really will be late. Bridget heard her sister's words, but they were muffled as though spoken from far away. She wanted to move, but she couldn't, frozen where she sat. Don't worry so much. The room in front of her spun around and around. Her arms and legs went limp. Her head fell forward in the second before her body slipped from the edge of the bed, and she sank to the floor, unconscious. Present Day Chapter 5 Val, Monday, 11.24 a.m. I leave the library with Terry Martin's card in my pocket. He asked for mine, too, although I don't know why he bothered. Polite, I suppose. And nice. I steer the car toward home, remember the wadded-up handkerchief in my bag, and think... Terry, the former detective, is a dinosaur, a relic from another time. I consider whether or not that's a good thing, but I can't decide. My phone chirps. Val Ritter. Val, it's Wyatt. I suck in my breath. I don't want to talk to Wyatt. I don't want to see Wyatt. He gets to be the grieving husband in spite of all he did to my sister. It makes my skin crawl. What do you want? He stumbles over his words. They're done. I mean, she's done. The medical examiner. My fingers tighten around the phone. 
What did she say? A detective called. He asked me to come down to the station to talk. I'd like you to be there. This takes me by surprise. When? An hour. His voice is thick, almost garbled, as though each word is an effort. Can you make it? I'll be there. I pause. Did the detective say anything else? Give you any idea about the report? Nothing different than what they said before. He says there's a question. Val, I feel like... I hang up. Wyatt's feelings don't concern me. They might have once, back when I thought he was devoted to my sister, but those days are gone. I turn the car around and head for the station. Passing the Baltimore campus of the University of Maryland, I force myself to calm down. If I go in with guns blazing, which is exactly what I want to do, I'm liable to be run out the door again. I've already been down there a half a dozen times and called twice that many times. The last time I showed up unannounced, the receptionist came around the desk and held up her hand. I'm sorry, Ms. Ritter, but you don't have an appointment. Do I need one? This is still a public building, isn't it? And you know me. How many times had I met with detectives or their PR rep when I was working a story? I'm sorry, she said again, in a way that made me think she wasn't sorry at all. You can't go upstairs. The scowl she wore reminded me of every teacher I had in middle school. I've been told to tell you there is no new information at this time, and the family will be notified as soon as there is. I had no choice when the security guard took notice. I wonder now if the detective knows I'm coming. After all, he didn't call me. He called Wyatt, the simpering would-be ex. I continue along West Fayette Street until I see the sign for the headquarters. I'm early, but I'm hoping to use that to my advantage. When I push through the doors, the receptionist rises and greets me with one hand glued to her ample hip. Ms. Ritter, I thought we had an understanding. We do, I say, but there's new information now. She stares at me, unimpressed. I was called. I conveniently leave out that no one from the police department phoned me. I know I'm early, but I thought maybe I could have a word with the detective before any other family arrives. Like the other times, she's a battle axe. I can't let you upstairs until I get permission. Can you call him? The detective, I mean. A security guard approaches but halts after one look from the receptionist. Fine. She inclines her head toward a wooden bench. Sit over there. As the minutes tick by, all I can think about is talking to the detective before Wyatt can get to him. Not that it's done any good so far, but I have a feeling it might be different now. This time, there's news. And a question. That has to mean something. Otherwise, why have Wyatt come all the way down here when a simple phone call would have sufficed? The receptionist is back. Detective Barnes is waiting for you upstairs. I thought I'd be talking to Detective Newman. She doesn't have time for me. Detective Barnes is who you get. Take it or leave it. Third floor. I take the stairs. When I walk through the door, a young man is there to greet me. Valerie Ritter? He holds out his hand. Detective Barnes. I freeze. He's a child. Or at least he is from my perspective. He's sporting a pimple on his chin and one of those haircuts that are long on top and short on the sides. I wonder how many years it's been since he graduated from high school. His handshake is firm, though, and I follow when he leads me to a tiny, windowless room. Take a seat, he says. The boy man lays a thin file folder on the table. I'm Detective Newman's new partner. I'm trying to get up to speed on our cases, so I'm glad you came in early. He opens the file, and I catch a glimpse of an official-looking report before he shuffles it to the back. I've been reading over his notes. He pauses as he flips through two pages, and I feel my anger swell. 
That's it? Two measly pages? According to this, you've already spoken to Detective Newman. A few times. Uh, yes, I see that. He gives me that look. The one that tells me he's already heard about me. I get the impression you don't think your sister died by suicide. No, I don't. Can you tell me why you think that? Isn't it in the report? I snap. He blinks, and I'm quick to backtrack. It won't do to alienate the kid before I've had a chance to tell him about my sister and about Wyatt. Maybe your partner didn't write everything down. Detective Barnes lifts one eyebrow. I'm not as interested in what the file says as I am in what you have to tell me, he says. It's my turn to stare, open-mouthed. What do you want to know? He takes out a notebook and pen. Start at the beginning. For one thing, there was no reason for her to be in that hotel or in Baltimore. She told me she was going to North Dakota. She does that a few times a year for work. He reads from his notes. Marketing consultant with Banford. Right. She helps companies identify and refine their target markets. It's mostly data-driven stuff, but sometimes she works with whatever ad agency has been hired to beef up the company image or brand. Barnes's glazed expression tells me he either doesn't understand or isn't interested. I move on. Her client in North Dakota is a snack company. They've been expanding, and she's part of the marketing team. Whenever she goes out there, my parents help out with the kids. Except she didn't have business in North Dakota this time. I called and checked. We have that. His pen hovers over the page, but he doesn't write. So your sister lied to you about going out of town? And to my parents. I tap my finger on the table when I say that. It's the most important part. She lied to everyone. He speaks slowly, and I want to shake him. Haven't I just said that? Instead, she stayed in Baltimore, in a hotel. Right. I'm not following. I stifle a groan. Either I'm not explaining this very well, or this is going to be harder than I think. She was hiding. From who? Her husband. He sits back. Why would she be hiding from her husband? They were separated. For the last year, he was having an affair. The usual. He met her at a conference. She understands him. Blah, blah, blah. My sister found out about it and kicked him to the curb. The words pour out of me, and I see he's writing everything down. Finally, I keep talking. For all Sylvia knew, it wasn't his first, either. His dark brows rise higher. Detective Newman asked me if she'd been depressed, but she wasn't. She was upset, at first, that's normal, but not the way he means. The affair took her by surprise, is all. But she got over it after a few months, and she did her best to keep things positive around the kids. Never said a bad word about Wyatt in front of them. She was that kind of mother. I pause, trying to read the boy man's face. Nothing. I know she wasn't sad anymore. She was dating someone, someone she really liked. Wyatt must have found out about it. Maybe he saw her with the guy or something and flipped out. I sit back. You need to follow up on that. He looks up from his notebook. Your sister had a boyfriend that her ex-husband may or may not have known about? Well, yes, and he's not her ex. Technically, they're still, or were, still married. Is that all? For the first time, I'm flustered. What does he mean, is that all? Isn't that enough? Barnes spreads his hands. I don't understand why you think your sister was hiding from Mr. Spencer. It occurs to me now that I should have started with this part. I hold up my phone. You don't know him. Listen, Wyatt called me a bunch of times last week. He knows I hate him, but he kept calling me, asking me if I knew where she was, that she wasn't answering her phone. I saved some of them. I scroll through my messages and hit play. 
The sound of Wyatt's voice, near screeching, pierces the air. Val, answer the fucking phone. I know you don't want to talk to me, but I don't care. I steal a look at the detective. Does he hear the anger? The venom in Wyatt's voice? Stop being a bitch and tell me where your sister is. There's a slapping noise, as though he's banging on a table. Shit, he says, and the phone goes dead. When was that? The boy detective asks. After checking my phone, I tell him. Tuesday afternoon, 416. He turns to a fresh page in his notebook and writes something. I try to make out the words, but I can't see clearly. Any other messages? There are four or five like that, I tell him. A couple others, not so bad. Can I hear the last one? I find it and hit play. Val, please, pick up. There are a few seconds of dead air before he speaks again. I need to speak to Syl. It's about the kids. His voice drops. There's no more venom. He sounds like a robot, as though he's reading the words. Please. When it's over, he asks when I got this last message. Thursday morning, about an hour before she was found. He writes that down. And did you try to call your sister during this time? It went to voicemail, but I wasn't worried. His forehead creases. Why not? Right before she left to go out of town, she reminded me she'd have limited service for a few days. His brow creases, and I explain. The town where she goes has like 1,500 people tops, maybe less. That's why there aren't many cell towers there. Service is spotty. I told Detective Newman this already. So this was Sunday? When she told you that? Yes. And you weren't concerned? Have you ever been to North Dakota? Cell service can be a luxury there. I did get one text from her. I tried to text her, too, but I don't know if it went through. The boy detective looks down at his notes, then at his file. Right, the text. She checked into the Franklin on Sunday evening. The next night, Monday, she texted you. He pauses. About her husband. I sit up straighter. Glad we're getting to the reason I rushed over to the station. Yes. When I saw it, I was glad she was in North Dakota and far away from Wyatt. At least I thought she was. Goosebumps erupt on my arms and I shudder. They had a fight. A big one, she said. I show him the text then. He reads, and I see him draw back at the words on the screen. He scares me, Val. Do we have a screenshot of this? I gave it to Detective Newman. He asks for another, and I send it. They were fighting about the divorce, I think. It was the first time she'd confided in me about it. Lately, whenever his name would come up, she'd shut down, not say anything. I thought she was doing what she always did and taking the high road, but now I know the truth, the real reason she didn't want to talk about him. She was afraid of him. All this time, she was afraid of him. A tear slides down my cheek, and I swipe at it. Now is not the time to weep. That's why she was hiding, why she made up this whole work trip thing. She didn't want him to know where she was. She needed time to think. I press my palms against the table. Somehow, he must have figured it out. When he couldn't find her, that's when he started calling me. And what did you say to him when he called? I didn't answer. I had nothing to say to him. He takes that in. Did you call anyone when your brother-in-law left you those messages? I called my parents after the last one. I wanted to make sure the kids were okay, but everything was fine. The kids went to school like normal. No problems at all. Had Wyatt been in touch with your parents? Yes, but I didn't know that then. I didn't find out until after... My words falter. Would you like some water? He asks. No. Heat rises from my belly to my chest and to my face. What I want is for someone to say it isn't true, that she didn't kill herself. I want you to talk to Wyatt. 
Detective Barnes rakes his hand through the mop of hair on the top of his head and stares down at his notebook. I inhale, waiting for him to speak. We've talked to your brother-in-law about his relationship with your sister, but he didn't mention anything about harassing her. <laughs> of course he didn't. He gave us a different version of the story than the one you've given us. All sunshine and roses, I'll bet. He says nothing, and I hold up my phone. You've heard the messages and seen the text for yourself. Syl was terrified. I know he did something. Maybe, he hesitates again. It's true that there are a few holes in his story, and it's possible your sister was upset, but either way, she was alone in that room and... A knock on the door makes us both look around. A detective pokes his head in the room. Barnes, there's a Wyatt Spencer here to see you. The boy detective gets to his feet. Is Newman back? Haven't seen him. Okay, tell him we're in here when you see him. The other detective nods and Barnes glances at me briefly. You can show Mr. Spencer in. I say nothing while we wait. Barnes fiddles with his pen, watching the door. Wyatt looks like hell. His shirt is wrinkled and bunched up around his waist, as though he couldn't tuck it in properly. There's a faint coffee stain on his pants. Based on his uncombed hair, I'm not sure he's showered. I have to hand it to him. He's playing the bereaved husband to the hilt. Val, I'm so glad you're here, he says. It's about my sister. Where else would I be? Although I don't try to hide my irritation, he doesn't notice. He shakes hands with Detective Barnes and sits down. Are you the detective that called me this morning? One in the same. Detective Newman is taking care of a personal matter. He should be here soon. I doubt that. Newman has been avoiding my calls and sicking the receptionist on me. But I keep my opinion to myself. As I told you on the phone, we've received the medical examiner's report. His long fingers drum a dull beat on the table. There are a few things I need to go over with you. My mouth goes dry at his words, the way it does whenever I know the news I'm going to hear isn't good. He opens the file folder and pulls out an official-looking report. The immediate cause of death has been cited as the toxic effect of a Zopoclone. What's that? Wyatt asks. Sleeping pills. He gives us the brand name. I recognize it from TV ads. Your wife, Mrs. Spencer, had a prescription. Oh. My worthless brother-in-law seems shocked by this, although I don't know why. Does he think Sylvia was as heartless as he is? It's true, she sometimes had trouble falling asleep in those early weeks after they separated. But that was normal enough, struggling to reconcile the upheaval in her life and still take care of her children, she got a prescription. I didn't like it, and I told her so. Val, I'm not addicted. I promise. I cut the pills in half when I do take them. Otherwise, I'm too groggy in the morning, and you know that's my favorite time of day. Oh, I knew that, all right. If it makes you feel any better, I have an appointment with Emily later today. It helped. A little. Emily was my therapist, a woman we'd known most of our lives. I recommended Sylvia see her. And I have a checkup with my regular doctor next week. Dr. Hart and Emily shared an office building. He wrote the prescription at her request. In spite of what Sylvia said, I wasn't satisfied. It's not only because they're addictive, I told her. You could start hallucinating, or get dizzy in the middle of driving, or start forgetting things. She set the pan she'd been drying on the counter and stared at me. Where are you getting all this? Before I could answer, she held up her hand. Never mind, don't tell me. You looked it up. She tossed the wet towel next to the dishes. Are you seriously thinking I'm going to turn into a junkie and smash up my car, or forget how to brew coffee or whatever? Come on, Val, you know me better than that. I did, but that didn't stop me from being a big sister. Are you taking them every night? No, Val. I flinched. 
It wasn't like Sylvia to get angry. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to snap. I only take them when I'm having trouble. I promise. What kind of trouble? She stood there for a moment. Sometimes I lie there and go over it again and again in my mind. How did we get here? Why did things go wrong? Sylvia, you didn't. Don't worry. I'm not about to give him a pass. Wyatt. Sylvia's voice dropped to a whisper. Wyatt threw everything away. He threw us away. I took her hand in mine and squeezed. He's an idiot. She tried to laugh, but it came out more like a snort. Sometimes I don't know about that. Maybe we got married too young. We rushed into it, so sure we'd never end up a statistic. And look at us now. Didn't you give me all those articles about waiting? Her tone had a bitter edge to it. You told me we should live together first. I wouldn't listen, would I? She shook her head. Now who's the idiot? I wanted to hug her, but I knew she was tired of my sympathy. She wanted to be past the sadness and the feelings of abandonment and loneliness. These were things I couldn't do for her, and it broke my heart. You are the most amazing mother and sister there ever was, I said. And I was wrong. If you'd waited, you wouldn't have Miles and Mary. She pulled her hand away and blinked back tears. They're pretty awesome, aren't they? They are. I'm worried about how all this is affecting them, though. She talked about the children and the idea of divorce many times before, and I'd never stopped her. I didn't then either. I understood her need to speak about her worries, her anxieties, and they lessened as the weeks and months passed. She found her new routine, her new normal. Things were good. Or at least, that's what I thought. Detective Barnes is talking again, his focus on the sleeping pills. We've been in touch with her doctor, the one who prescribed the medication. We had a few questions for him, but he wasn't as much help as we'd hoped. I sit up straighter. What kind of questions? He clears his throat. The prescription bottle was from about a year ago, dated January 18th. According to both the doctor and the local pharmacist, one prescription was written and filled. No refills or other scripts. I'm wondering if either of you know if she switched doctors or filled her prescription at a different pharmacy. Wyatt doesn't speak, so I jump in. Did you speak to Emily? She might know. If you mean Ms. Rogers, yes. I take it you know her? I do. Dr. Hart is Sylvia's primary, but Emily is her therapist. Mine, too. We've known her since we were kids. Did your sister ever mention switching doctors or therapists? No. She would have told me. Why? Barnes fingers the pages in front of him as though deciding how to answer. The level of toxicity in Mrs. Spencer's system, even after three days, was 4.6. He looks from Wyatt to me. This would be considered extremely high under any circumstance. But in this case, I lean across the table, hanging on his every word. I don't understand, Wyatt says. Barnes clears his throat. The level of a Zopa clone found by the M.E. doesn't match the prescription. His words take a minute to sink in, but even after they do, it's not clear to me why this matters. Somehow, I manage to keep my voice steady. What does that mean? Well, like I said, the prescription is from last January. He pulls a picture from the file. The photo shows a bottle lying on its side on a bedside table, the label visible. I know in an instant that it must have been taken in the hotel room, the one where they found my sister, and I shiver. He taps on the image of the bottle. As you can see, the prescription is for one pill to be taken in the evening as needed. He looks up again. According to Ms. Rogers and Dr. Hart, there would have been 14 pills in this bottle, enough for two weeks. Both said Mrs. Spencer was worried about taking pills, and they agreed on a low dosage on a trial basis. 
And when Mrs. Spencer returned for her follow-up visit, she said she was sleeping better and didn't need a refill. This is consistent with what Syl told me, and I say so. She was cutting them in half when she did take them, because she didn't like the way they made her feel in the morning. Barnes accepts this. Let's say that's true. If she took them for a week, even if it was only half a pill, she'd have no more than nine or ten pills left in the bottle. He spreads his hands on the table. Do you see my point? I don't, at first. His words tumble over one another in my brain. Sill's prescription was for two weeks. She didn't refill the prescription, but the levels of the drug in her system were high. I gripped the edge of the table. That's not enough pills, right? She couldn't have done that even if she wanted to. So that means... Barnes cuts me off. It means that the amount of medication believed to be in this bottle doesn't match the level of medication that was in her system. Nothing more and nothing less. I sink back down. The boy detective is turning out to be like his partner after all. Wyatt rubs the whiskers on his chin. How much did she... He pauses. How much was in her system? The Emmy couldn't put an exact number on it, but the range was 24 to 30. Wyatt, bless his hateful heart, says what I'm thinking. But if she never had that many, how is that possible? We don't know how many she had. Even though this prescription was for 14, she could have had other prescriptions. That's why I asked you if she switched doctors or pharmacies. Maybe she got a refill somewhere else and combined the contents of the bottles. I'm quick to knock that idea down. No, I told you, if she wanted a refill, Dr. Hart would have been the one to write it. And I know she was still seeing Emily once a month. There would be no reason to go to someone else. There would be if she wanted to hide an addiction. Gritting my teeth, I say, she wasn't addicted. Wyatt jumps in again. I agree with Val. Syl hated taking anything stronger than headache medicine. She wouldn't have done that. And yet, she had this prescription. Wyatt winces, and I want to smack him again. He was the reason she needed the prescription in the first place. He drove her to it. The detective flips to a page in his notebook and writes something down. I have no idea whether he believes us or not, but I'm more convinced than ever that none of this makes sense. The door opens and Detective Newman steps in. Barnes, can I see you outside for a minute? The young detective gathers his folder and his notebook, leaving us to wait. I'm alone with Wyatt. Hives erupt on my skin and I scratch at them. Val, I'm glad we have a few minutes. I have nothing to say to you. I start to get up and swing back around to face him. Wait, I do have something to say. I jab my finger into his chest. Just because Sylvia isn't here to stop you, don't think this means Danny is going to step in and replace her. She can't be around the kids, especially right now. Danny isn't a demon, Val. You don't know anything about her. It's all I can do not to scratch his eyes out. Oh, well, I say, my lip curling. If you say so, then it must be true. Wyatt ignores me. Val, listen, there are some things I need to tell you about Danny and me. He runs a hand through his hair. Nervousness or maybe guilt, makes his eyes jump back and forth. A wave of nausea almost knocks me over. Could he actually be choosing this moment to tell me he's engaged? Is there no end to this man's lack of sensitivity? He licks his lips. And about Sylvia. Something you're not going to like. I'm on my feet now. I have no intention of giving him the chance to make his announcement or whitewash the latest ways he was making my sister's life a living hell. I don't want to hear another one of his apologies or another weak excuse for why he was a total bastard to Sylvia. Not going to like? My fingers tighten over my phone. 
over the evidence I've shared with Barnes. There's nothing you have to say to me that I don't already know. Sylvia texted me from the Hotel Wyatt. Did you know that? His mouth drops open. She told you? Yes, she told me, I say. Did you think she wouldn't? Christ, why couldn't you leave her alone? God knows I don't know why Sylvia gave you a pass for so long, but to be clear, I'm not my sister. I won't make the same mistake she did. I take a breath, my outstretched fingers swinging between us. You and me? Unless it's about Mary or Miles, we have nothing to say to each other. Without waiting for him to respond, I leave, the door slamming behind me. Outside in the hall, I flex my hands to stop them from shaking. The buzz of voices drifts over the sounds of clacking keyboards and ringing telephones. Newman is talking to Barnes. I slide down the hall and turn my ear in their direction, catching snatches of conversation. Shut it down. Still questions. Waste of time. I tiptoe closer, sticking to the wall, and peek around the corner. Newman and Barnes are ten feet away, huddled near a coffee machine. Detective Newman's mouth is turned down, his hands jammed in his pockets. Barnes is sipping from a styrofoam cup. These people have families, Newman says. We already know the woman killed herself. You're making it worse, encouraging them. I don't think so. And what about that text? The one from the deceased to her sister? Newman hesitates. The husband said they weren't fighting. Didn't know what I was talking about. And you believe him? It doesn't matter whether I believe him or not. We've got the M.E.'s report, and it was the deceased fingerprints on the bottle. What more do you need? His story, though. There's no proof that any of what he said is true. It's all I can do not to whoop out loud. The kid was listening to me after all. Newman, though, sighs heavily. Barry, it doesn't matter. Whether they were fighting or doing the dirty doesn't change what went down in that hotel room. We followed procedure. We talked to the family, the staff. You saw the pills. No sign of foul play. We're not in the business of trying to figure out why she offed herself, only if it's the cause of death. If so, that's that. Are we clear? Yeah, we're clear, Barnes says, and takes another sip of coffee. But I'd still like another day or two to track down the source of the pills. The older detective lifts his shoulders in a shrug. Whatever makes you feel better, Barry. But if we catch an actual case, I'm gonna need you to shut this down. You understand? Sure. I'd better get back. I scurry down the hall and position myself outside the door. I can't let them shut down the investigation. A day or two isn't much time, but it will have to be enough. Chapter 6 Terry Monday, 2.20 p.m. I sit at my desk, untwisting one paperclip after another. I keep thinking about Val, the woman from the library, and her sister, and the Franklin. It's none of my business, but that doesn't stop me. I place a call to the department, where I still have a few contacts. Sure, I'll wait, I say. Two more paperclips turn into crumpled metal sticks. My old friend Woodward comes back on the line. Suicide. OD on a bottle of sleeping pills. ME report came in a couple of hours ago. I thank Woodward and sit back. If Val persists in believing her sister didn't swallow those pills, she'll be swimming upstream. A part of me feels bad for her. She's lost her sister in a heartbreaking manner. Not that there's a manner that's not heartbreaking. But in my experience, suicide has a strange way of making the people left behind feel some measure of guilt. I don't really know Val, so I can't say if that's what's going on with her. But it doesn't take much to recognize when someone is hurting. 
Val is a woman hurting. Sweeping the pile of twisted paper clips to one side, I pull open my top drawer and dig in the back until I find the blue file. The cover is faded, and the corners are folding in on themselves. It's thicker than I remember, filled with clippings, printed pages, and old photos. I flip through the newspaper articles one by one. Each story is different. Murders, suicides, men, women. There are years and sometimes decades between the stories. One thing ties them together. It's none of my business. Saying it out loud doesn't work the way I hoped. And another paper clip joins the pile. I look at the mangled clips and hear the voice of my former partner, Chet Holden. I know you're thinking hard when you got a box of those paper clips, Martin. What is it this time? He'd laugh then, the sound rolling over the squad room. I miss Holden and the job. Reaching in my pocket now, I take out the card Val gave me. The Baltimorean Daily. It's one of the oldest papers in the city. Many of the articles in my blue file were printed in that paper, although none were written by Val Ritter. I type her name into my computer. There's an archive of her stories on the paper's website. She's listed on a couple of other journalism websites, but I can't find any social media accounts. Either she doesn't have any, or she uses a different name. Scrolling through the papers for the last several weeks, I find the coverage on the two suicides at the Franklin. The jumper was more than a month ago. Karen Hill, 26, with a history of mental illness. Karen traveled to Baltimore from New York by train the previous day. According to medical reports, she skipped her meds. In one article, the woman's parents claimed that without her meds, Karen tended towards psychosis and debilitating depression. That, combined with the note left on the woman's bed, led the authorities to determine her death was suicide. I search the articles for any other details, but find nothing of significance. A more recent article mentions the foundation the young woman's mother established in Karen's name. The article about Val's sister is brief, and I read the words twice. Police were called to the scene of a death at the Franklin early Thursday morning. Although the victim has not been named, the woman is reported to be a resident of Baltimore County and the victim of alleged suicide. This is the second suicide at the Franklin and the 601st in the state of Maryland this year. Nationally, close to 50,000 lives were lost last year to suicide, an increase of nearly 25% since 1999. According to the CDC, the suicide rate among males is three to four times higher than the rate among females. Both suicides at the Franklin this year were female. The victim was discovered in her hotel room shortly after 9 a.m. by hotel staff. The Franklin declined to comment. Doing a search on each of their names, I discover that Karen, the younger woman, had multiple social media accounts. Her activity was sporadic and appeared to be tied to her state of mind. A flurry of bright, sunny posts in good times and more somber and alarming ones during darker moments. Maybe if she'd stayed in New York, things might have been different. I find a link to the Mother's Foundation and make a small donation. Val's sister's name turns up a business profile and a Facebook account. Her lone social media account is private, I take out a notebook and jot down what I've learned. Names, sex, age, background, exact cause of death. There's nothing similar about the deaths of these women other than their gender and the location. Is that enough? I can't say, but I don't think I can let it go. I pick up the phone again. Billy, how's it going? I listen, ask about his family. Yep, I'm good. Look, I was wondering if you could do me a favor. I explain what I want. Billy doesn't answer right away. When he does agree, he warns me that his help will be limited. I tell him I understand and I'll call back later. 
After hanging up, I finger Val's business card. Her sister's death was a suicide. I can't change that. And yet, Val's insistence that it's not nags at me. I want to help her, although if I'm honest with myself, her doggedness is not the sole reason. It's none of my business. And what can I possibly learn that will make any difference? I tap the business card against my desk, and in spite of my doubts, make a decision. I hope it's not the wrong one. 1921. Chapter 7. Bridget. Margaret knelt on the floor, cradling her younger sister's head in her arms. Bridget, Bridget, please wake up. Bridget's eyelids fluttered. Margaret's face hovered over her, features blurred. Bridget blinked and struggled to sit up. You fainted, Margaret said, worry lines visible under her dark bangs. Do you want me to call mother? No. Her sister arched one penciled brow. Please, Bridget begged. I'm fine. You're not fine, Bridget. I'm just hungry. She got to her feet, stumbled, and reached out to grab the bedpost. Margaret kept a grip on her elbow. I don't need mother. Fine, I won't call her, Margaret frowned. But you don't look hungry. You look scared. Was she? Bridget couldn't be sure anymore, couldn't trust her own feelings. Both women sat down again. What are you not telling me? Bridget dropped her chin to her chest. Would speaking be a betrayal? And what if she was wrong about Lawrence? Is it because Lawrence was married before? Is it about what Mother said? Bridget sat silent. Margaret wrapped an arm around her. You're my sister. If you're afraid of something, you can tell me. In fact, you must. Bridget opened her mouth, but the words wouldn't come. Margaret took her by the shoulders. Why did you faint? What are you afraid of? She searched her younger sister's face. Surely not Lawrence. Bridget bit her lip. Maybe Margaret couldn't understand either. Luella had taken her seriously, but then, of course, she would. She'd been married to Lawrence for eight years. But no one knew she'd spoken to Luella, and no one would believe what his former wife had said, certainly not her mother and father, nor Margaret. Bridget wasn't even sure if she did. She stared at the floor, silent. You're not, are you? Afraid of Lawrence? She gazed down at the soft swell of Margaret's belly. Bridget couldn't begin to think about burdening her sister with her worries now. It wouldn't be right. No, of course not. The lie tasted like rancid oil on her tongue. Getting married is a bit frightening, though, isn't it? Margaret's hands pressed into Bridget's skin. You're sure that's all? Worried she'd alarmed her sister, Bridget forced her lips to stretch wider into something approaching a smile. I guess I'm a bit nervous. Oh, well, goodness, Bridget, that's normal, Margaret said, loosening her grip. Why, the day Charles and I got married, I couldn't even choke down a bit of egg that morning. Do you remember? Mother swore I wouldn't eat because I refused to wear that corset, but it wasn't that at all. I was so terrified. Bridget sat forward. She didn't remember anything other than excitement and happiness. You were? Oh, yes. What if I tripped or said the words wrong? What if I couldn't have babies? So many things went through my mind that day. Did you ever worry you'd made a bad choice? You mean married someone else? Yes. No, never, Margaret said, fresh concern etched into the contours of her face. Are you sure this isn't about Lawrence? A few seconds passed. Is it, Bridget? Her mind screamed, yes. But if she admitted the truth, 
How could she explain her fear when she didn't understand it herself? Aloud, she managed a whisper. He's so much older. Is it twelve years? Thirteen. That's not so much. Although he was married. Her expression grew pensive. Mother told me his first wife had to be sent to a mental institution for a while. The poor man. Can you imagine? Bridget hid her shaking hands in the folds of her dress. No. Terrible. Exactly. Her voice brightened. Come on, little sister, let's get you in your dress, she rose. And I promise you, after Lawrence takes one look at you in that gown, you'll be fine. You will be the most beautiful bride anyone has ever seen. The silky fabric of the white dress cooled her skin and racing pulse. She slid her feet into satin slippers, powdered her pale skin, and stained her lips. Margaret brushed Bridget's hair until it shone, pinned it in the new style, and fixed the comb of the veil. There, her sister said. Beautiful. Bridget gaped at her reflection in the glass, transfixed. The gown shone in the morning light. The lace train floated behind her like a cloud. Margaret wasn't wrong. She did feel better. But even as she thought maybe she'd been overreacting, Luella's words echoed in her mind. Run away. Run away as fast as you can. Chapter 8 Bridget Three Days Earlier Bridget walked the four blocks from the trolley stop, the wind whistling in her ears. With each step, she feared her legs would give out. She looked behind her, but there was no one there. She needed to get control of herself. Lawrence had traveled to New York on some kind of business. Her parents thought she was at the store, though she'd taken the afternoon off. There was nothing to worry about. Standing on the brick stoop, Bridget raised her hand to knock, dropped it again. What if this was a mistake? What if she was making something out of nothing? Her mother had remarked more than once that it was one of her specialties. Why, just the other day, Catherine had brought up the time Bridget insisted their neighbor had tried to burn his house down, only to find out it was nothing more mysterious than a fireplace cinder sparking and catching on the heavy drapes. And then there was her mother's personal favorite, the time Bridget insisted a friend had stolen her treasured bracelet. You merely dropped it, Bridget, her mother had said after it turned up in the parlor. And now you've made such a fuss accusing poor Hannah. I sincerely wonder if the Atkins family will ever forgive us. Lord knows I wouldn't blame them if they didn't. I didn't drop it. Don't argue with me. Her tone was harsh, but no harsher than any other time her mother had decided she'd misbehaved. You're getting to be more and more like your sister every day. Her father had flashed her a warm smile and patted his wife's hand. Now, Catherine, Bridget didn't mean to falsely accuse Hannah. I'm sure she had a perfectly good reason to do so. And she had. More than once, she'd spotted Hannah wearing something that didn't belong to her, or seen her brag about her new hat or lipstick or another item she'd lifted from a friend. Only the year before, she'd stolen Margaret's favorite parasol, the one with the painted horses, and claimed Margaret had thrown it away. This wasn't true, but Bridget's mother and father weren't prepared to call Hannah a liar after Margaret admitted she had left it outside. Bridget's sister was scolded for carelessness, and Hannah got to keep the parasol. I haven't stepped foot in the parlor in two weeks, Bridget had insisted and I was wearing the bracelet on Saturday. It was Hannah's brother who'd tipped her off, confessing he'd seen his sister flaunting it to her new friends. When Bridget had gone to her parents, Hannah had feigned innocence, and the bracelet had shown up a few days later. It couldn't have been me who put it there. It hadn't mattered, though. Her mother had chalked it up to Bridget's fanciful imagination. Bridget suspected the Atkinses knew better. They'd moved to another neighborhood soon after the bracelet incident. 
Bridget shook away the unpleasant memory, drew herself up to her full height, and knocked on the heavy door. When no one answered, she knocked again. The door creaked open a few inches. Spectacled eyes looked out at her. Can I help you? I was hoping to speak with Luella. Are you a friend? She considered lying, but decided against it. I don't know. Frown lines creased the elderly woman's forehead. You don't know? Well, we've never met, but I think I might know her. You think you might know her? Bridget cringed at the way the woman kept repeating her words. I've come all the way across town hoping I could talk to her. Just for a few minutes. From across town, eh? Must be important. It is to me. The woman came out onto the stoop, her head on a swivel. Are you alone? No one followed you? Confused, Bridget tried to see who or what the woman was searching for. The street was quiet, far from the busy downtown where she worked and several blocks from the fancy apartment buildings close to her own home. The houses here were short and squat. There were no arched doorways or porches or pillars. A single automobile was parked at the end of the road, but she saw no one else. She shivered at the chill in the air. I'm by myself. How do you get here? I took the trolley and walked. The woman seemed to consider this before saying, Come in. Bridget blinked, her eyes slow to adjust to the dimly lit entry. You can wait in here. The woman led her to a small living room. This room, too, was dark, the heavy drapes drawn against the afternoon sun. A single lamp burned in the corner. I'll get her. Bridget sat on the sofa. After several minutes, Luella appeared in the doorway, a slip of a woman with ashy hair and hollowed-out cheeks. Bridget got to her feet. Luella? Yes. Do I know you? There was no animosity or anger in her voice, only a kind of mild curiosity. She perched on the other end of the sofa, her hands folded in her lap. Have we met? I don't think so, Bridget said, sitting down again. I hope I'm not bothering you. It's no bother. I don't get many visitors. I spend most of my days in the garden or with my paints. You must be feeling better then. The woman cocked her head to one side. Who told you I was ill? Oh, well, uh, Bridget stammered. I heard that you'd been in the hospital for a while, but you're out now. I'm glad you're better. Luella blanched. I haven't been in the hospital. Who told you such a thing? Bridget's thoughts tumbled over each other. Had she somehow heard wrong? Or was Luella lying? She glanced at the doorway. This was a mistake. I shouldn't have bothered you. Luella's outrage turned to accusation. Who told you I'd been in the hospital? Her hand clutched at her throat, and she ran to the window, pulling aside the drapes to peer out the window. Is he here? Is he watching me right now? She whirled around toward Bridget. Is he? Bridget shook her head. No one's watching you. Are you sure? She asked her bony fingers locked together. I promise. You're alone? Yes. Did he send you here? No one sent me here. I came on my own. Luella sank back down on the sofa, her narrow chest rising and falling. Her head dropped into her hands. Bridget glanced at the doorway again. Are you okay? Fine, she sniffled without looking up. I'm sorry. For a minute, I thought he was back. Who? Lawrence, she said, the word a whisper. Bridget blinked at the woman, unable to speak. Luella shuddered. Did he tell you I was in the hospital? She gave a single shake of her head, not waiting for an answer. I know it was, but it's not true, you know. Not that he didn't try. He wanted to have me put in a mental institution. He even took me there once. 
but the doctor was a friend of my father's and he sent me home. Heaven knows he couldn't have his name mentioned in connection with the Altoona Sanitarium. Not that going home to father was much better. Her words were tinged with bitterness. He sent me back to Lawrence. Back to my husband, he said, where I belonged. The sanitarium might have been better. Bridget shivered. She'd made a mistake. Beneath Luella's mild manner was an angry woman, a woman scorned. In the end, it didn't matter, though. Lawrence had our marriage annulled. Luella looked up, and the features of her face contorted into something that reminded Bridget of a wild animal, hunted, dangerous. When she spoke again, her small voice had grown larger. Did you know that? No. We were married for eight years. I was with child twice. Both times I lost the babies after a few weeks. He became convinced that I must be full of sin, that the sin was making me incapable of bearing him a son. There were punishments, she said, spitting out the word. Bridget's hands flew to her mouth as she drew back. Why are you telling me this? If Luella heard Bridget, she gave no indication, but continued. In the last two years, I was unable to become pregnant at all, and he became angrier and angrier. And then it happened. I was with child. The words caught in her throat. I wanted to have a baby more than anything, but I was afraid. Bringing a child into that house? I... Her voice faltered. I didn't tell him about the baby. He found out later. Maybe if I had. Bridget wanted to cover her ears, didn't want to hear any more, but she couldn't move. I... I lost the baby after a bad night. He blamed me for keeping it a secret, for forcing him to punish me. I didn't care anymore. I wanted to die with my baby. She dropped her head into her hands, her shoulders shaking. After a moment, she wiped away her tears with the backs of her hands and lifted her chin. That's when he decided to get our marriage annulled. She gave a harsh laugh. Having me committed didn't work, so I was labeled barren. I'm sorry, Bridget said, voice shaking. All of Luella's body seemed to sink into itself as though swallowed up in some kind of invisible pain. Don't be. I was lucky to get away. Bridget peered around the dark room. There were shadows on the walls and on the woman's face. She didn't get many visitors, spent most of her time alone. There was nothing about her life that appeared lucky. Are... are you happy? Luella's colorless eyes narrowed. You didn't say why you were here. She angled her head as though considering Bridget for the first time. Do you know Lawrence? Not trusting herself to speak, Bridget nodded. She shifted under the woman's scrutiny, her skin flaming. How do you know him? What reason do you have for coming here? Unsure how to answer, Bridget opened and closed her mouth. Everyone said Lawrence was devoted to her, and she knew this to be true. So what was it that bothered her so much she'd trekked across town to find out more? Was it because he put her up on a pedestal that she knew she didn't deserve? Was it the sharp look he gave her once or twice, or the cross words that followed when she'd said the wrong thing? Of course, there'd been gifts and praise and apologies after. Even Margaret had commented she'd never seen such devotion. Suddenly, she was embarrassed she'd come. I'm engaged to be married, she said, her voice soft. I see. Luella's small hands curled over the fabric of her dress. You're very young. Bridget didn't say anything. I was young once. She stared down at her hands, twisting them in her lap. But that was a long time ago. Bridget hesitated. The man you've described, it doesn't sound like Lawrence. Doesn't it? She asked, her voice brittle. 
You're not married yet. He wasn't like that when I first met him, you know. Her words softened. I thought he was the most wonderful man in the world. He used to call me his angel back then. Bridget gasped. It was the same name Lawrence used for her. I am but a poor sinner who is fortunate to be in the company of an angel, my golden angel, he'd said the other evening. Then he'd raised his glass in a toast. To Bridget, kind in spirit, gentle as the wind, and the angel of my dreams. She'd blushed and laughed. You would not have thought me so angelic had you seen me with one of my customers today. Bridget had started to launch into the story of a demanding customer at the store, but he cut her off before she could even get a few words out. You could never be anything but perfect, Angel, and that is why I can't wait for us to be married. As he talked of their wedding and the life he was planning for them, her mind had wandered. Did you mind? Bridget asked Luella now. Being his angel, I mean. Oh, no, not then. Her thin lips rose in a half smile. I was flattered. More than flattered. I did everything to live up to that name. I spent all my time trying to please him. And for a while, we were happy. Her words fell away, and she raised a shaky hand to her temple. She watched Bridget as she spoke. After I lost the baby the first time, he started calling me something else. Bridget tried to reconcile Luella's story with the man she knew. But even at his worst, he was nothing like the man Luella depicted. Punishments? How could that be true? Luella stood, the corners of her mouth turned down, her face hardened. You don't believe me. It sounds... She couldn't finish, unwilling to offend the woman. You're a fool, Luella said, her pale skin coloring. You don't know what you're doing. Wild-eyed, she stared hard at Bridget. Bridget shrank back, unable to meet Luella's feverish gaze. She didn't want to offend her, but the woman didn't make sense. Yes, there were things that sounded the same, but not most of it. And there was something strange about Luella, something that made Bridget afraid. It wasn't hard to picture this woman in a hospital, in an institution. I came to hear what you had to say, and I've done that now. You don't believe me, she said again. But you have doubts or you wouldn't be here. I didn't say that. You didn't have to. Bridget rose, every muscle in her body tensed. I'm sorry to have bothered you. I'm sorry, too, but not for me. Luella reached out and wrapped one bony hand around Bridget's arm. Please don't tell him you found me. Bridget jumped and her heart clutched. Even if she didn't believe Luella, there was no mistaking the woman's fear. I won't. I promise. Thank you. Even as the lines around her mouth smoothed, her hand tightened her fingers pinching Bridget's skin. Run away. Run away as fast as you can. Present Day Chapter 9 Val Monday, 2.45 p.m. My phone vibrates on the passenger seat. I don't recognize the number, but I haven't recognized much of anything these last few days. I certainly don't recognize a world without Sylvia, much less one where everyone believes she could have taken her own life. Willing the caller to be the bearer of better news, I answer, swerving to pass a slow-moving clunker from another century. I hope I'm not bothering you. A man's voice comes over the line, but I thought maybe we could meet up for a cup of coffee. Who is this? I ask, regretting my decision to answer. It's Terry, Terry Martin. We met at the library this morning. Oh, I fall back against the leather seat of my car. Was the library only this morning? Sorry, I say. I didn't recognize your voice. 
No need to apologize. How about that coffee? I can't speak at first. I don't know why I would want to have coffee with the man who was a front row witness to my breakdown. I would think he'd be happy to be rid of me. I know I would be. My surprise shifts to suspicion. Whatever he wants, I don't have time for it. I'm headed to see my sister's therapist. Our therapist. After what I learned from the police about Sylvia's prescription, I've decided it's time to take my research from passive to active. It's not a good time, I say. I'm on my way to see someone. Not a problem. I'm at the office taking care of a few things. We could meet at your apartment. There's a pause. We could meet after your appointment. I take the exit ramp that leads out of the city. Why can't we discuss it now? I'd rather do it in person. I have plans. Turning onto a four-lane road, I pass strip malls with high-priced grocery stores, boutique shops, and nail salons. I'm in the suburbs now. My sister's house isn't far, but I turn the car in the opposite direction. That stop will have to wait. I need to go, I tell him. It's about your sister's death. My breath catches. I'm irritated again, but I'm curious, too. Where's your building? I ask. He tells me. It's not far from the medical suites where Emily has an office. There's a coffee shop on the corner, Java Beanery, I say. Do you know it? Yes. Four o'clock? I'll be there. I click off, pushing Terry, the former detective, from my mind. I have other things to think about. Emily rises when I walk in and wraps me in a hug so brief, I can't be sure it happened. Val, I was so sorry to hear about Sylvia, she says. I can't imagine how difficult this must be for you and your family. Thank you. I know you were a big help to her after the separation. She retreats to the safety of her desk and waves a hand toward the patient chair. How are you, Val? I have no interest in talking about myself, so I don't. Sylvia had been coming to you for almost a year. Yes. She presses the pads of her fingers together but says nothing more. I know she'll let the silence stretch, let it percolate until it bubbles over and the quiet is louder than any words. It's an old trick, one I've used often as a reporter. Even the most resistant sources will fill the silence, given enough time. Emily, I'm going to be blunt. I don't believe Sylvia took her own life. If I thought this pronouncement would earn me some kind of reaction, I'm sorely disappointed. I press on. You've known Sylvia and me almost our whole lives. Emily says nothing. Syl was still seeing you, wasn't she? Not as often as before. Only twice in the past few months. The last time was... She pauses and scrolls through her phone. Six weeks ago. She was supposed to come in the Tuesday before last, but she didn't show up. I can't hide my surprise. That's not like Sylvia. Emily shrugs. She called me later to apologize, offering to pay for my time. Of course, I told her not to worry about it. Emily and her family lived in our neighborhood when we were girls. We played in the same park, went to the same neighborhood schools. Emily had always been nice never ignored us like many of the older teenagers did. Did my sister say why she didn't show up? No, and I didn't ask. I file this information away. I need to ask you some questions about Sylvia's medication, whether she said she was still taking it, and how often. Emily sighs. Val, I can't talk to you about what Sylvia and I discussed. That's privileged, even from you. Her hands drop to her lap. You know this is why I was reluctant to see Sylvia in the first place. I don't normally see patients from the same family, unless it's a group therapy situation. I understand, but this is different. She's gone now. It's not different to me. Her facial expression remains neutral. Val, if you'd like to talk about your grief, I'm here for you. Again, I ignore her concern and take a different approach, sharing what the police have told me. She wears her doctor mask, the one that can't be shocked or shaken. 
When I'm finished, she nods once. The police were here earlier. I keep my mouth closed. Two can play at this game. I can't tell you anything specific, but I can tell you what I told them. At my recommendation, Dr. Hart wrote one script for Sylvia. No refills. I've spoken to Edward. If she got more, it wasn't through us. Did you and Sylvia discuss how the medication was working? Yes. Did she indicate she wanted to continue using it? These are areas I can't talk about. The last time you saw her, how did she seem? Did she seem depressed to you? Unhappy? Val, she draws out my name. Okay, how about this? I tell you what she told me, what I thought about how she was doing, and you can tell me if I'm wrong. When she doesn't say anything, I take her silence as permission to continue. I thought Syl was doing great. That's why none of this makes sense. I mean, right after she found out about Wyatt, she was devastated. That's why I sent her to you. I was worried. The first few weeks were difficult. She barely got out of bed on the weekends when the kids stayed with Wyatt. She lost weight, wasn't seeing her friends. But after a couple of months, things started to get better. Mary and Miles needed her, and she needed them. She rallied. She forced herself to start running again, to start participating, even when her heart wasn't in it. She told me that was your suggestion. True. She was coming up on the anniversary of the separation, and I was worried. But when I talked to her about it, she told me I was overreacting. It seemed like she was right. I mean, she seemed happy. She was laughing all the time, even dating. I pause watching Emily's face closely. She was involved with someone. I almost miss the flicker of her eyes. Sylvia confided in Emily. I'm sure of it. Do you know who it was? She evades my question with one of her own. If she told you she was seeing someone, why do you think she didn't tell you more about him? I open my mouth to answer, but I can't. I've asked myself the same question. It wasn't that her dating was a secret. She showed me the new dress she bought for a recent date, mentioned he brought her flowers, but nothing more. Not that I hadn't tried. What does he do? How old is he? Is he tall, dark, and handsome? I asked as we walked along the inner harbor. The sun shone down on us, the day unseasonably warm. Sweating under my turtleneck, I shed my jacket. Sill, though, looked as cool and beautiful as ever. The sun caught the lights in her hair and her cheeks glowed. Her scarf fluttered around her neck, the deep greens of the silk matching her eyes. He's a businessman, she said finally, and he has brown hair, dark brown. It was like pulling teeth. Is he tall? Taller than me. So tall, then. I guess. Is he divorced? Widowed? Does he have kids? She threw her head back, laughing. Val, please, no more questions. Just let me enjoy it for a little while. I was so glad to see Sylvia happy that I didn't push. Now I wish I had. Eyeing Emily, I ask, Do you know who he was? Do you know his name? Is it important? Her question takes me by surprise. I don't know. Probably. I'm sorry, Val, but I can't help you. She's lying. I know it, and she knows I know it. But there's nothing I can do. Emily would never betray Sylvia or any patient. I've got to cut this short, she says. My four o'clock will be here soon. I stand up. My legs are shaking, and I have to steady my nerves. I haven't asked the one question I need to ask, the one I'm most afraid to hear the answer to. Emily, do you think Syl did this? Do you think she killed herself? Her lips part. I'm not a perfect therapist, Val. I see patients with all kinds of problems, big ones, small ones. Sylvia is not the first patient I've lost. 
For a moment, Emily's smooth expression cracks, and I catch a brief glimpse of the pain and emotional toll of her job. My entire body is trembling, but I don't let up. But Sylvia wasn't like your other patients. She wasn't sad or depressed. And she wouldn't have left Marion Miles. I know that in my heart. Emily is silent. Please, do you think she would do that? Take her own life? Emily's shoulders sag as she considers. After another long minute, she lifts her hand and straightens. If I give you my opinion, it shouldn't be taken as fact. You understand, don't you, Val? It's only my opinion. The same as I gave the detective who was here earlier. A new terror races through my mind and rips at my heart. Still, I need to know. I understand. Emily takes so long to answer, I wonder if she's changed her mind. Sylvia was a beautiful person, Val. I was very fond of her, you know. My heart lurches in my chest. I've seen many patients through divorce, other losses. Some never get over it. But that wasn't your sister. She didn't look backward. And as you said, being a mother was everything to her. I bite down on my lower lip. So no, I don't think she would be capable of any type of self-harm. I exhale. I want to run around the desk and hug her, but her next words stop me. But that's my opinion, and one not shared by the police. They have their reasons, and nothing I say will change their minds, as far as I can tell. There's sadness and pity in her voice. I'm sorry, Val. She pauses. None of this speculation will bring her back, you know. I'm worried you're not dealing with your grief, with losing her. If she notices my physical withdrawal, she doesn't say. I can make you an appointment if you'd like to talk more. I don't. I know she means well, but she should know me better. I can't deal with anything until I know the truth. The police are wrong, I say. She didn't do it. She wouldn't. I grab my bag and fling it over my shoulder. I have to go. Take care of yourself, Val. The door closes behind me before I remember to tell her about the last text from Sylvia and my worry that Wyatt has grown angry, maybe violent. I could go back, but I don't. Emily may have couched her words carefully, but she's already told me what I wanted to hear. Sylvia didn't kill herself. I stand outside the Java Beanery, peering through the large glass storefront. Terry is sipping from a paper cup of steaming coffee and watching the door. A cold wind blows and I pull my coat around me. I don't know why I'm here, wasting time, but I would like some coffee. A bell rings over my head when I enter, and he gets to his feet. He's taller than I remember, and broad-shouldered, in a way that suggests he's not just a former detective, but also a former athlete. I notice there are gray flecks woven through his curly brown hair. The same gray peppers the light stubble covering his strong jaw. I don't remember any of this about him, although I can't imagine why I should have. Thanks for coming, he says, and gestures at a second cup on the table. I ordered you a black coffee. I can get you something else if you'd like. I touch a hand to my hair, wondering when I combed it last. I'm sure I look a mess, but I figure that makes sense. I am a mess. Exhaustion washes over me, and I take the coffee, grateful for the caffeine. You called, and I'm here, I say, lifting the cup to my lips. What do you want? Are you always so friendly? I open my mouth, but whatever words I might have snapped die on my tongue. His lips are turned up at the corners in a half smile. He takes another sip of his coffee. Damn, why does he have to be so nice? And easy on the eyes to boot. I set my cup on the table. I checked you out. He doesn't flinch. A positive. I would expect nothing less. You were in homicide for 15 years. 
Impressive closure rate. No infractions. Two citations. Why haven't I heard of you before? Although there's no outward reaction, his skin colors a fraction. This I find interesting. I'm not big on the spotlight, I guess. You worked some high-profile cases, although none I covered. I wouldn't know who did the stories for the paper. That's for the press department to handle. His answer fits what I learned about him. Solid, smart. It makes me wonder again why he quit. Do I pass? He asks. For now, I say. You said you wanted to talk to me about my sister? I do. I'm curious as to why you think your sister didn't take her own life. Because she wouldn't. He holds my gaze, unwavering, silent. Damn him. He leans back and finishes his coffee. The barista at the counter calls out names, setting fresh cups on the counter. The bell rings every time the door opens. It makes me want to scream. His voice is soft now. This feeling that she wouldn't take her own life. Does your family share it? And her friends, do they believe as you do? I sit up straighter. Before I can open my mouth, he holds up his hand. If I were the detective assigned, you wouldn't be the only person I would talk to. Presumably, your sister had friends. There would be other family, co-workers. I'd question more than one source. No detective would rely on one person's word here. It's been my experience that there are times when people are too close to see what's right in front of them. And even in the case of an obvious suicide, a full report would have to be written. Medical examiner's report, description of the scene, interviews with the family of the deceased. I pull my arms in tight to my chest. I don't give a crap about police reports, and I'm questioning this whole role-playing thing. Terry, the former detective, no matter how attractive or well-meaning, is wasting the limited time I have to convince the police to keep this investigation open. But he's relentless, a trait I can't help but recognize. And like. Was your sister married? I give him the shorthand version about Wyatt and the affair and the separation. That must have been hard for her. The way he says it makes me steal a glance at his ringless hand. He switches back to the case. I'm guessing the police have been talking to him about what's happened then. What's happened? The phrase strikes me as wrong, as trivial and fixable as spilled milk or tracked mud or a flat tire and wholly inadequate to describe the loss of Sylvia. Death is not a what's happened. It's gut-wrenching. It's mind-numbing. It's a searing pain no medicine can dull. Believe me, I've tried. A tear slips over my cheek, and I no longer care that he's trying to help. I reach for my bag, but he catches my hand. Please, I'm not trying to upset you. I don't move. I tell myself it's not because of the warmth of his palm on my skin. It's everything. All of it. I'm so tired I can't muster the strength or the energy to pull away. The bell at the door rings then, and I take back my hand. Yes, the police have talked to him. And do you know what he's told them about your sister's state of mind? Thoughts fly through my brain, none of them kind. I know what he claims he told them. Which is? He said it doesn't sound like her. If he hears the scorn in my voice, he doesn't let on. I find myself wondering about all the suspects he must have interviewed when he was a detective. For one moment, I envision Terry having a go at Wyatt, staring him down, getting him to confess. How would it start? Would he admit he was a failure as a husband? That he dumped a wonderful woman for a childish copy? That when she was finally happy again, he tormented her, scared her? That he lost control and went too far? The stupid bell rings again, and my imaginary law and order scene evaporates. Terry is staring at me. What? I asked you how their relationship was after the separation. 
Oh, it's a loaded question. How can I explain the arc of their marriage and separation in a way that will make him understand? Aloud, I say. It's complicated. I glance at my watch and stand up. Look, I know you're trying to help, but I have to go. He pushes up from the table. I'll come with you. You don't even know where I'm going. I don't have to. Something tells me wherever you're going has to do with your sister's death. And I'd like to help. Or try to. The man is persistent. I have to give him that. Don't you have a job? I took the rest of the day off. Besides, I haven't explained what I wanted to talk to you about. The idea I have. I can't help myself. In spite of everything, I'm still curious. Tell me now. If I'm interested, you can come. Fair enough, he says. The Franklin. It has cameras. Most hotels do. I think about this, and I know he's right. Even so, I don't understand how it matters. So? They don't have them in the rooms. But they have them in the lobbies, hallways. Some even use them in the elevators. He shifts, leaning toward me. Like I told you earlier today, I'm in security. We're a pretty tight community. I know the guy who runs security at the Franklin. I wrote his recommendation for the job. And? I might be able to get us a look at the video from the days your sister stayed there. My hand closes over the back of the chair. I'm playing catch-up, but the wheels are grinding now. Maybe the cameras wouldn't be able to catch what happened in my sister's room, but they would show who walked through the lobby in the hours leading up to Sylvia's death. I already know why it was threatening my sister. That's motive. But if he's on the video, that's opportunity. I hold up my keys. I'll drive. What an opening! Is there any truth to Val's suspicions that Wyatt is to blame for what happened to Sylvia? And what to make of this Terry character? His offer to get access to the hotel video footage is hard to refuse, but his interest in the case seems quite peculiar. And poor Bridget. Is there any truth to Lawrence's ex-wife's claims? Will she still walk down the aisle in spite of all she's heard? Stay tuned to find out. So don't forget to subscribe to CamCat Unwrapped. If you don't want to miss a beat, listen to Her Sister's Death now on the audiobook platform of your choice. All our books are also available in print and ebook formats on camcatbooks.com or wherever books are sold. Tune in to hear all our audiobooks as we release them right here on CamCat Unwrapped as serialized podcasts. The first two episodes of every book can always be found here but subsequent episodes will be available for free listening only for a short time after their release. After that, they'll be gone. But don't worry, the audiobooks are available for purchase on Audible and other major retailers. CamCat Unwrapped also offers other CamCat books as podcasts. Also, check out our background episodes where we interview our authors and have them participate in fun writing challenges. Before you go, please take a moment to leave us a review on your preferred podcast platform. Thank you. Tune in again to CamCat Unwrapped, because CamCat Unwrapped is where book lovers meet.